With this lecture, we're going to begin uh, studying quantum mechanics as opposed to molecular mechanics and look at various computational models that are founded on quantum mechanical principles. And in order to do that, I'd like to spend a little bit of time going back and revisiting, for most of you I hope, or at least uh, reminding you of some of the key foundations of molecular orbital theory that derive from elementary quantum mechanics. And so for this particular lecture, I'm going to focus on the variational principle, and in particular, the variational principle when applied to molecular orbital wave functions that are formed as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. And so to remind you of what the variational principle or the variational method is, I'll remind you that the Schrodinger equation is a sort of disarmingly simple equation, h psi equals e psi, and it says there are these exact wave functions, eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator, that when operated upon by the Hamiltonian, you'll get back the energy times the eigenfunction. However, unfortunately, we only rarely can actually determine what the exact wave functions are by some analytical solution to a particular Schrodinger equation. So there are various toy systems in quantum mechanics where we really can do that. The particle in a box has an analytic solution. The harmonic oscillator has an analytic solution. The one electron atom actually has an analytic solution, and that's an interesting one. But in many instances, we just don't know what the eigen functions and associated eigenvalues are. Nevertheless, we certainly can always guess a wave function, that is, as long as we have a function of the proper coordinates, the same coordinates for whatever function we're interested in, and so let's say it were to be a one electron atom, as long as you guess something that has coordinates of x, y, and z for the electron, that one electron orbiting about a nucleus, uh, you could write down a guess wave function and you can evaluate the energy of your guess simply by computing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian operator. And so that's the integral over all space. This is just three-dimensional space. If it were really just one atom, maybe you'd use spherical uh, coordinates, but, or you might use Cartesian coordinates in a different instance, but in any case, space. The complex conjugate of your guess wave function the Hamiltonian operator in between, and that'll have kinetic energy and potential energy parts, and that depends on the system, and the guess wave function again. And just for convenience sake, since it might be that your guess wave function is not normalized, you simply divide by the integral over all space of the square modulus of the wave function. So if you have a normalized wave function, that'll be one, and you don't have to worry about it. But if it isn't one, this will take care of the normalization. Now, because your guess wave function is some arbitrary function you plucked out of thin air, it will certainly be true, the variational principle says, that you cannot find an energy lower than the exact ground state energy. So E0 here, that's the energy of the exact ground state eigenfunction. And anything else you guess, because it'll be a little bit different from that best, lowest energy function, you will get a higher energy, or maybe you just are a spectacular guesser and you will get equals here, but in general, greater than. So this is an equation that holds true in general. And it's a very important equation because what it tells us is if we have a lot of alternative guesses we might make, we have a way to distinguish the quality of our guesses we simply compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and if the energy goes down, we have a more accurate estimate for the ground state wave function. And we can just keep making new guesses, always trying to drive the energy down, until we get tired of guessing, and we'll have our lowest energy as sort of our best estimate. But even more important than that, we can actually take advantage of this sort of boundary condition, lower limit condition that is, to use the tools of variational calculus when our guess wave functions depend in some sense on parameters. So we have a way to optimize those parameters in order to drive the energy as low as possible. And in particular, within the context of calculations for molecular orbitals in molecules, one way to imagine constructing a molecular orbital 
is as a so-called linear combination of atomic orbitals. So phi will represent some molecular orbital, and I will create it in space as a linear combination over some number, capital N, of atomic orbitals, which are called basis functions. And so uh, my basis functions here will use this little curly phi. I apologize, these would both normally be called phi, slightly different font look to them. So I'll have some coefficient associated with each atomic orbital in my basis set, and I'll make my molecular orbital as just a sum with some weighting factor of a bunch of atomic orbitals. And how might I go about picking that basis set? Uh, well, there are many ways I might do it, uh, as long as these... A molecular orbital, if you will, when you think about it, it is something that has amplitude at every position in space. Some places there will be a lot of amplitude. That says there's a high probability of finding an electron there if it were in that orbital. Other places, low amplitude. By using atomic orbital basis functions, which presumably are centered on atoms, those are functions, S functions, P functions, D functions, they're mathematical functions, which we know in a free atom do a decent job of describing where an electron might be in space. And as a result, it's sort of intuitive that by summing them together with different weights, I might do a good job of describing where an electron is in space in a molecule. Now, the point is that I have these free parameters, these uh, small a values. And what I'd like to do is I would like to optimize the a values for a given molecular orbital. And that's what the variational principle can allow me to do. Now, a molecular orbital is a one electron wave function. In fact, a many electron wave function is formed as an anti-symmetrized Hartree product. So a Hartree product, I'll just remind you, is a product of molecular orbitals. So if I've got an electron in phi one and another electron in phi two and another electron in phi three, it's the product of those orbitals, phi one times phi two times phi three. But because electrons are indistinguishable and because uh, fermions, like electrons, the sign of the wave function must change sign when you interchange any two coordinates, you need to anti-symmetrize that product. And one way to do that is with a Slater determinant. And so again, this is sort of elementary quantum mechanics. And I, I certainly don't have time and you probably don't have energy for me to uh, recapitulate an entire one semester course in elementary quantum mechanics in a couple or three lectures but hopefully you remember taking a look at anti-symmetrized products of orbitals. But what I want to look at next is I want to come back to the minimization process. So if I do have a one electron orbital, I'm going to come back to the energy expression. How do I evaluate the energy of an electron in that orbital? So I take the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and so now I've replaced phi by its sum, this is on the complex conjugate side, of course, but in any case, I sum over my basis functions, complex conjugate of the coefficient, complex conjugate of my atomic orbital. Over here is phi, not in complex conjugate form, it's just the linear combination of atomic orbitals. And I've replaced it down here as well for cap for phi star and down here for phi. So, of course, this is a sum, and this is a sum, so I will have capital N terms in this sum over here, and I'll have capital N terms in this sum over here. That'll give me a total of N squared different products of terms. So the first term here with the first term here, the first term here with the second term here, the first term here with the third term here, and so on. So what I can do is, well, first off, these A's, they're just numbers. I'll pull them out in front of the integral. And for ease of notation, I'll now sum over two indices. Both i and j are running over n. So there's n squared terms here in this sum. What's left behind is an expectation value of the Hamiltonian over the basis functions. And not just over a single basis function, but I can have two basis functions with different indices, i and j. And so too, in the denominator, I do exactly the same thing, but there's no operator here or if you will, the operator is multiplication by one. That's a way of thinking about that integral. So again, I've got integral over products of basis functions where they don't have to be the same basis function. And because these are atomic orbitals, potentially on different centers, there is no guarantee of orthonormality here. That is, it's not necessarily the case 
that just because I have two functions with different indices, their product integrated over all space would be zero. It can certainly be non-zero. So again, for ease of notation, this is usually abbreviated in a shorthand way. The integral, which represents the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, evaluated for two basis functions, i and j, over all space, is just written capital H with the indices of the basis uh, set function, so h, i, j. And so, too, when it's the integral over all space of the product, that's s, i, j. And the names for these kinds of integrals, these h, i, j integrals, are called resonance integrals. So, resonance integrals. So, in the numerator, n squared resonance integrals appear. And the integrals in the denominator are called overlap integrals. So S represents an overlap integral. And so now let's think what it means to minimize the energy with respect to all of these coefficients A. In order to do that, it must be the case that the partial derivative of E with respect to every single one of these coefficients is equal to zero. If you like, the slope of your function e as a function of these uh, variables a is zero. That defines a stationary point. Now, incidentally, it, it, it can define many kinds of stationary points. First, uh, saddle points, uh, hilltops, what have you. But it certainly is true for a minimum that you must have partial e with respect to all the a's is equal to zero. And so this is the mathematical symbol meaning for all. So partial e, partial a, k equals zero for all k. And it turns out that if I, if I carry out this differentiation, I take the partial derivative of this expression, looks a little bit ugly, but I'll do it anyway, uh, with respect to a for all, all values of k, I get n linear equations, each of which must be satisfied in order to, have, to be at a stationary point of e. And those equations can be written this way. There are n of them, so I'll have an index i that's running from 1 to n. The coefficients themselves, so the exact same coefficients that are appearing in this LCAO expansion for the molecular orbital. Resonance integrals, overlap integrals. And I, I do want to in emphasize, what's an integral? An integral can often sound like a very obscure concept. Uh, you know, you hear the word and it just doesn't offer any intuitive meaning. An integral is just a number, right? When I get done at the end of the day, I know this function, it's an atomic orbital function, I know this operator. It might not be an integral I can go look up in a table easily, it might not be analytic, I might have to do something numerical in order to solve it. But when I'm done solving it, I just get a number, 13, negative 4, 2.6. So this is just some number in here. Here's another number, the overlap integral. And finally, here's E itself. So the quantity I evaluate by solving these integrals. So I have n linear equations. They must be equal to zero themselves for all k. And you might ask, well, under what circumstances can you actually solve a system of n linear equations in n variables? Remember, these are the variables we're trying to solve for, the a values. When can you solve a system of n linear equations in n variables where all the equations are set equal to zero? And from linear algebra, we know the answer to that question. You can solve these equations if and only if the determinant of the coefficients. So in this case, the coefficients, and this is a sort of a tricky part in, in following these lectures, up till now, I've called these things the coefficients, these a values. That's because the molecular orbitals are formed as a linear combination of atomic orbitals where each atomic orbital is multiplied by this coefficient a. But now I've moved further on in the problem. At this point, I'm trying to identify what these values of a are. They are the variables in these linear equations. And the coefficient that multiplies these variables is hki minus eski. So I need to form a determinant of the coefficients of my variables, and if and only if the determinant is equal to zero, then you can find variables that solve these n equations, n variables that solve these n equations. So what is this determinant? Uh, well, before we get to that, I'll, I'll say this equation is called 
the secular equation, and this determinant, which appears on the left-hand side, is called the secular determinant. So many people encountering this for the first time think, ah, here's another example of science and religion being incompatible because this is not the religious equation, it is the secular equation. However, it actually has nothing to do with that. This uh, secular derives from the Latin, actually the Italian, I guess, would be secolo, which means uh, century. And century is uh, what the equations are, secular. So they were first uh, brought into being, I suppose, in order to explain variations in celestial motions that needed to be corrected over the course of about every century. The planets would end up where they weren't expected to be, and in the course of figuring out why that was, somebody had an equation like this, and it was called a secular equation, and it was only much later that it was uh, found to be important as well in quantum chemistry. So that's a little aside about why it's called the secular equation. But let's come back to the thing I want you to keep in mind. Here's this determinant. It needs to be equal to zero. But notice that within the determinant, there is one thing we don't know, and that's the E value. Remember all these H's and S's? Those are just numbers. I have no control over those. Given uh, molecular geometry, I will be computing H and S by solving integrals. They might be tough integrals, but I'll get some numbers and that's that. But to set this determinant equal to zero, what I'll need to know is what values of E, what are the allowed energies that would make the secular equation true, which means when I go fill in these coefficients using those values of E, I will in fact be able to find values of A that solve the uh, linear equations, and those will be the A values that deliver me a molecular orbital. So because the secular equation then is a polynomial of order n, and so if you were to expand this determinant, and this one's arbitrary so it would be a mess, but uh, if you think about just a plain old 2 by 2 determinant, Remember how you solve that. You take the product of this diagonal minus the product of this diagonal, and you can see you'll get an e squared term arising in this product, and you'll have an e squared term arising in this product. In general, it is the case that given that e appears to first power in every term, that when you expand this determinant, you will get a polynomial equation in e of order n. That is, e to the nth power will occur. And the fundamental theorem of algebra, I think, says that there will be n roots of that equation. Uh, that is, there will be n different values of E that will allow you to find coefficients, val valid coefficients that solve the linear equations. Now, some of those roots may be equal to other roots. We would call those degenerate roots. Uh, some values of n might be complex. That could be sort of interesting as well. But in any case, for every one of those E values, and now I will start indexing them because there are more than one, so I'll call it E sub J. So the Jth value, for the Jth value of E that, solved, that allows the secular equation to be true, there will be a unique set of A sub I. So you see, I, I need two coefficients now, right? The I is running over my basis set. Oh, this is an, the first one is an s orbital on a hydrogen. The second one is a 1s orbital on a carbon. The third one is a 2s orbital on the carbon. That's what I would be going over. But J will just be staying fixed as I'm talking about the first energy root, for example. So I'd have A11, A21, A31 as I'm running over my basis set for energy 1. So I runs over basis functions. J runs over MOs for the energy EJ. So I solve the linear equations, which I can do because the secular determinant was equal to zero, and with those coefficients, I can build my molecular orbital. And it'll be the jth molecular orbital because there will be capital N molecular orbitals that are possible that I can find, each one with its associated energy value. So to try to make this more concrete, what are the steps in a calculation if I have a molecule somewhere in space? So we'll assume that that's sort of step zero. I've laid down some atoms somewhere, and I've dictated how many electrons I have. I know where the nuclei are. That's that. So step one, select a set of capital N basis functions. All right, so I have to decide what are the mathematical functions I'm going to use to try to represent molecular orbitals. 
go on to determine all n times n minus 1 over 2. So by symmetry, it's not n squared. It doesn't matter uh, whether you, the nature of these integrals is such that it doesn't matter whether you have uh, ij or ji. So the total number is n times n minus 1 over 2. It does grow as n squared, but you get a little value from symmetry. Compute all these numbers, hij and sij. Might be hard, might be easy, but anyway, you get a whole bunch of numbers. Form the secular determinant. That is, just, I'll go back a slide here, just fill this in. So if h11 is 2 and s11 is 1, it'll be 2 minus e. And if h12 here is 4.6 and s12 is 0 0.2, it'll be 4.6 minus 0 0.2 e, right? You'll just get a whole bunch of something times e, something times e, constant time minus something times e, and so on. Determine the n roots of e sub the n roots e sub j that satisfy the secular equation. That is, expand out this determinant or use, you know, the powers of linear algebra as coded into some useful computer program to determine the capital N values of e that make this equation true. And then, for each one of those e's, go back, plug in that value here, given that you already know all the h's and s's, and find the a's that satisfy the system of n linear equations. There will be a different set for each one of these e's. And when you're done, you will have the molecular orbital coefficients, the, I should say the coefficients multiplying the atomic orbitals in the basis set, to describe capital N molecular orbitals. So, uh, some food for thought before you go into the next lecture, just to see if uh, you're on top of things and see if this, this is cemented for you. You can think about this. In general, what are the upper and lower limits on capital N, the number of basis functions? And I'd ask you to think about this from two sides. That is a question of physical requirements. So the lower limit really is dictated by physical requirements. Think about that. What, what would be the lower limit based on uh, just, you know, you can't do it with less. And then the upper limit is dictated a bit by practicality. So there's not necessarily a hard answer to that, but think about what the practical issues might be. And if it helps you to have a specific example to think about, uh, you know, let's just pick a molecule to talk about, formaldehyde. If you have the molecule formaldehyde, what would be your lower and upper limits on, on N? And then just to get familiar with the notation, because there are so many shorthand ways to try to avoid writing horrible things, try just jotting down for yourself, how do you write a generic, and completely generic that is, resonance integral or overlap integral in Dirac notation, and so that involves bras and kets, and then in standard mathematical notation. And, in, and also, make sure you understand what are the integration variables? What are we actually integrating over in the, what's the differential variable in the integral? Finally, here's something that uh, certainly will show whether you're getting a, an intuitive feel for the resonance and overlap integrals. And that is, under what circumstances might you expect the values of those integrals to be zero? And so this is a really important thing in doing computations, is that you never want to waste a lot of time on a computer evaluating something that is going to turn out to not contribute uh, to some important value. And so in our case, when things are zero, they don't contribute to an energy, for instance, or, or, th or in any case, maybe you do want to add zero for completeness, but you'd like to see it ahead of time. You don't want to do a lot of floating point operations to get zero. You'd rather just be able to say, oh yeah, that's obviously zero. I'll just plug in zero. So under what circumstances might you be able to say, oh, well, that is so obviously zero. So I'll let you think about that, and we will start exploring uh, the integrals in a little more detail and how we get at these resonance integrals in particular in the next lecture.